fantastic. Well, in the interest of time and wanting to give Sharif as much time as possible, uh, I'm going to get us started. You have his full bio on your agenda, so I'm just going to read a couple of sentences off the top and then turn it over the to good stuff, please. Yeah. So for the past three years, Sharif Edmund has served as the City of Los Altos' Administrative Services Director. He is in charge of the Finance, Human Resources, and Information Technology Departments. Sharif came to Los Altos from the City of Campbell, where he served as Finance Manager since 2014. I encourage you to read his full bio um, on the agenda. With that, I would like to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Shelly. So I have my microphone. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here, especially with all the movers and shakers of Los Altos. <laughs> and it's nice to see a lot of smiling faces. Um, as Shali mentioned, I've been here for three years. Um, I've done about, this will be my fourth budget that we're into as we move forward. So I'm um, very happy to share with you the budget, very happy to share with you what we're doing and our priorities and kind of the fiscal lens of what we're doing. So a couple disclaimers. I guarantee you the numbers here are different than where they are now. Um, we are in November, so I'm going to show you budget numbers. I'll show you some fund balances that might be from the CAFR from last year or different pieces. But we are four or five months into the fiscal year. Um, when we get to mid-year, which is usually the first or second meeting in February, that's when we do our um, mid-year update to council and to the community. And we have already closed out the books. So we're literally closing out the books now for July. We're doing our CAFR and our audit and our different pieces, so the numbers are dancing. So this just gives you an estimate of kind of where we're at. So some of these things you'll be able to, to backtrack and walk into from the budget or you see from the CAFR or they might be a little um, different as we move forward. So first disclaimer. Um, the, what does CAFR stand for? Oh, the CAFR is the, the annual financial audit. It's basically our, our financial report. So it's the consolidated annual financial report, which is only a couple hundred pages. They call it consolidated. <laughs> um, but we also do what's called the PAFR, which is the popular annual report, um, which I'll talk about. And that PAFR, there's only 11 cities in the whole state of California that do the PAFR. It's basically our annual report, and we received an award the last two years for that. So we're very proud of that. And that's your seven-page report that you can actually pick, pick up and, and read and look at, where the, the CAFR is more about the audit and the different pieces. Thanks, Dennis. Um, also, one last disclaimer. Obviously, I am the finance director. I also happen to be the HR director, so I will... Um, add a couple of my two cents when it comes to HR, IT in the presentation, but I'm really talking about the fiscal impact, the fiscal lens, how we look at things through the, the finances. I won't be talking about the drama of downtown or parking or this impact or that impact. That's for, for others to, to look at and decide. I want to discuss kind of that fiscal piece. Um, so with that, <clears throat> did want to start with the council priorities. Every year, usually in January, the council comes up with their annual goals. Um, these were adopted in April, and basically they're a little bit of a twist from the council priorities from 2018, and I won't read everything to you, but you can see that downtown was a priority. The community center, obviously by December 2020, we will build a new community center, um, was a, is a priority. Um, city assets are a priority, and we'll talk about that in detail today, really focusing on our city and our city infrastructure, and we've been talking about for many years um, about our um, infrastructure and how it really is in dire need of a remodel and or demolish or a new building for all the different assets that we have. Um, housing and land use, um, looking at affordable housing and looking at other pieces was a priority for, for council. Uh, traffic safety is also a priority and that's, that's a, a theme throughout our capital improvement budget that you'll see. Um, community engagement was a priority for them as well. And then public, <coughs> public safety I think is always on the list obviously for um, the city of Los Altos. So those are the council priorities. And with that priorities and with those different pieces, you would hope that your budget would match those priorities. So we want to fund those council priorities as we move forward. So you can then say, where did your money go towards this? Um, another thing that we're adding to our budget is we have uh, performance measures. And we actually have those that we can say, here are performance measures in our budget to match our council priorities. So the budget is always evolving to um, match that. So my goal today is for all of us to have a better understanding of the budget, to have that hallway conversation so when you're walking downtown you can kind of get a, uh, an idea of, of where we're at for our budget and what we do. Um, to give you some context, we are a $45 million city. And what we mean by that is our revenues are $45 million. That includes general fund and all funds um, for the city. So in any given year, our revenue is $45 million. Um, we have 136 approved full-time employees. Um, we have about 60 part-time employees that come and go, depending on the season, depending on recreation, especially in the summertime. So we might hire, hire up to 60 employees. 
um, during that time um, for part-time folks, and we also have part-time throughout the year. Um, to give you some context, the city of Palo Alto next door has over 1,000 employees, right? You might have a city of Mendel Park that has, you know, well over, you know, four or 500 employees um, for, um, for the city. So we are not considered a small city. We're obviously not a, not a medium or large city, so we're, I would consider ourselves a medium-sized city with our population, obviously, of over 30,000 people. Um, when we talk about the property tax, and it's no, it's no secret, the property tax runs Los Altos when it, comes to the, when it comes to the finances. When I say, who's your daddy, who's your mommy, it's property tax. Mm. So out of the $45 million in revenue, right off the bat, $25 million of that $45 million is property tax. So you can see on the right, I put the numbers on the left so you can see, but on the right in the pie chart in blue on top, that's your property tax of $25.6 million. One of the first things I did when I first came as finance director is I was kind of the skeptic to see, was property tax really that, is it really that big of a deal? Is it really that, that strong here? And what I did was I, ten, I did a 10-year history and a 10-year look back. And the city of Los Altos has never not met its budget in property tax. So the city of Los Altos is unique in that not only are we in a bubble in the Silicon Valley, but we're in a bubble within a bubble. And we all know when you have a house that's $400,000 many, many years ago that sold for $4 million, that return is your property tax increase, your growth year over year. And just to give you an idea of what we look at um, on the finance side, we have well over 40 years of inventory of houses that have yet to turn over that could be two, three, or $400,000 that will sell for three, four, five, and $6 million in the future. So property tax is as strong as it can possibly be. Um, when I looked at the 10-year history and we looked at fiscal year 08, 09, and 10, when, the, when basically the world was crashing around us and you had the, the biggest downturn in the history of the United States for 60, 70, 80 years, Los Altos still met its budget, to give you some, some context. So property tax growth year over year might not have been five, six, or seven percent in that year, but it still met its budget. Um, right now, um, when, I, when I first came to Los Altos, I, um, I budgeted five and a half percent growth year over year for the budget, which means that property tax would increase by five percent every year. Now, I budgeted 8% to give you an, an idea. And I'm a fiscal conservative. I, I'm not a risk taker. I look at things, I look at them twice. And if you tell me I have $10, I'll put nine. If you tell me 20, I'll put 18. I'm not gonna put that $20. So even with that, when I put this, the 6%, the 7%, the 8%, last year's property tax was well over 10.5% growth. So we just keep exceeding the property tax growth year over year over year. If you ask me now, when we look at the reports of where we're at, it is softening and it is slowing down, but it's not zero for Los Altos. It's not 5% for Los Altos. A slow year might be 6 or 7% growth. And so that's one thing just to take away, that property tax just continues to be strong, it continues to grow, and if you saw the last 10 years, you would see it was at 19 million, then 20 million, then 22, then 25, and 27, and it will be more next year. So obviously when I look at the finances for the city, property tax is the most important thing to look at. When you look at sales tax, you can see sales tax is the, the, the red on the left there of $3.3 million. We can talk all we want about sales tax. You can talk about growth, you can talk about not growth, all the different pieces. It's not gonna move the needle much on that $45 million. So sales tax for Los Altos is in a unique position in that we're flat, and we've been flat for many years. Sales tax does not grow in Los Altos. So when we see downtown busy at lunchtime or you see it busy on the weekends, it still does not equate to a sales tax increase. For the first time this year, I'm actually budgeting a decrease in sales tax because we do not have big box stores. We do not have, you know, besides a couple on El Camino and, and Safeway and things like that. But there aren't many things that move the needle for sales tax. So that's an important point I want to note on just the finance side. So in order to move the needle on sales tax, we have to make a change. And that, that falls onto council and the community, obviously. <coughs> We then have utility users tax, which is your 3% um, or 3.5% on your phone, your cable, all your other pieces. A big piece I want to talk about is the transient occupancy tax. We are a small city. We only have three hotels. However, we do receive $3.3 million, $3.4 million in TOT. It's a big deal for those three ho small hotels. So you can imagine what TOT might be in a city like Menlo Park or Redwood City or San Carlos, where they have 10, 15, 20 hotels. Um, the biggest piece that happened financially was the passage of the TOT increase that the that U.S. voters passed. Right now, or last year, the um, TOT um, tax that you pay on a room was 11%. The voters approved up to 14%. 
Now what council decided is rather than do a one-time increase, we're doing it 1% a year. So now it's 12%, it'll be 13%, and then we'll, we'll peak at 14%. The big, the big piece financially on that is just that 1% increase is $700,000 a year to the city, right? And I wanted to make a note of that $700,000 because we're going to park that number because it becomes very important in the future why that TOT increase is so important. If property tax is increasing and everything else is flat, we need something else to help boost the economy, if you will, or boost our um, revenue. You can then see we have some smaller pieces like business license tax, construction tax, document transfer tax. That's part of the transfer of ownership for, for different pieces. So the total taxes is $36 million. Then we have interest income. We have a very small rental income. Interest is always all over the map depending on the economy. There are some years, as, as you remember, um, we might get half a percent on our interest income. Right now I think we're at 2%, which is uh, much better. So with that, you, ha you then have your recreation fees of $1.4 million. Um, important note on this is that recreation fees are usually $2 million. We actually built in a $600,000 decrease for the next two fiscal years as we build the community center. So as we have less facilities, less classes, less availability for the community to use, we're actually predicting, obviously, less revenue and less expenses for the recreation department. Once the community center is up and running, and we'll talk about that, then obviously we'll go back up to that $2 million and more with our um, beautiful facility that we have. One piece that is a huge driver in our, um, our finances are the community development fees. You can see there it's $3.6 million. In a typical year, it might be 2.5 or $3 million, but these are all the developments that are occurring in Los Altos. Typically in Los Altos, those developments are remodels. Remodels, housing, um, your residential buildings, all those different pieces. So anyone who's remodeling, your, you're remodeling your kitchen, you're remodeling your bathroom, you're doing anything, you're gonna pay those d development fees. You're paying for your building inspector, you're paying for your engineers to go out there, you're paying all your fees for all those different pieces. The community development fees have been increasing by 10 and 15% the last three years. So every year we've seen an increase in community development, obviously because there's more development in the community. There are more remodels, there are more houses being torn down and being rebuilt from scratch. But then you also have development from, um, from bigger projects, obviously. If you have a 20 unit condo coming up, if you have a 40 unit condo downtown or on El Camino, they're paying very large development fees as well. Um, what we do see is that we are now in the peak of that um, growth. And I think that would match kind of what you've seen out in the world. We're, we're starting to hit the peak of all of the developments and, and construction different pieces. So I don't see us having this revenue the same next year or the year after. It'll start to taper down. Um, what we do in community development is because we need more building inspectors and more staff, instead of hiring staff full time forever and they become a liability on your PERS or your, um, your uh, retirement, is we hire part time staff. So we have part time <coughs> building inspectors, we have part time staff at the desk to help us and we use obviously that revenue to help pay for that so that you're not waiting two, three months for your building inspection. It, it, we try to maintain that metric of what um, John Biggs has, our director. And then as the economy slows down or as community development slows down, then the part-time folks will then taper down as well. So um, that's one thing that we've done. Then we have franchise fees, which is part of your um, sewer and solid waste. There are admin fees and, and franchise fees that we receive. That's part of that revenue as well. And then you can see police fees one of the things I say, for those of you that ever received a ticket or a parking ticket, it doesn't do much, so, as you can see. So we'll need to raise those. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so total fees are about $8.6 million. So I, it's missing the last line here, but the general fund, rev, not general fund, but total fund revenue um, equals $45 million. So that's how we come up with our $45 million city. Sharif, how many businesses Good question. I think it's 1,400, I'll have to get the exact number, I can get that to you, but yeah. It's pretty impressive, the business license number that we have for a, a small city. So one of the things that makes us unique and that many of you have, uh, have heard is that we do not budget up to our revenue. So we do not try to break even as a city. Many cities, if you make $10 million, you're gonna spend $10 million and you're gonna break even. Then when times are tough, you're gonna run out of money, you're gonna have to use your reserves, you're gonna have to lay off staff, you'll do different pieces. Los Altos is unique in that we are very conservative, and that has helped over the, the past 10, 15 years because we, we never budget up to our revenue amount. We could very easily say we make $45 million, let's have our expenses match $45 million, and we'll deal with the downturn when it comes. However, we have a built-in surplus, and we've used that word many times in the community. Um, 
that surplus, because we budget, so you can see our expenses are $41 million. So if we were to meet our budget and revenue, or we meet our budget and our expenses, we spent exactly 100%, we still automatically have three or $4 million built in, and that's by design. That's by, by design by being conservative, that's by design by not being risk takers as a city. Um, but that also means that you might be understaffed at certain points. When the economy goes up and you need help, you might be understaffed. When projects need to get done, you might not have the, the budget to do that. So there's pros and cons, obviously, to, to doing that piece. Um, when Chris Jordan and I came along, Chris came uh, about six months before me, um, we kind of changed that approach. And the first thing we wanted to do was take out the word surplus. This is not a surplus. What happened in the past, as you all know, the city of Los Altos would make money year over year, and we would have a surplus. That surplus, you take the money, we'd stick it under the mattress. And we'd stick it under the mattress. And we'd stick it under the mattress. So $2 million, $3 million, $3 million, year over year over year. And then we had this huge CIP fund, which had $25 million in there. That was great, but the reason why we had that money and we put it under the mattress is because we didn't do anything as a city. We didn't upgrade the community center. We didn't change city hall. We didn't upgrade garden house. We didn't change Grant Park. Right, and that's coming back to bite us now because obviously our infrastructure is falling apart. And it, it took us over a million dollars just to maintain our buildings. So when they did an infrastructure report and they came out with a report that says just to maintain the level that you have right now is costing you a million dollars. We're actually losing money because we haven't done anything to these buildings. So what Chris Jordan and I talked about and with, with council's help is that we need to invest in our infrastructure. It's nice to have $25 million sitting in the bank under the mattress, but we need to use it and we have to spend it. So when we had that money sitting in the bank, and we'll talk about all the funds um, that we have, those funds were gaining 0.7, 0 0.9% interest rate in the bank. The construction costs were going up 5, 6, 7% year over year. So I finally went back to council and explained to them, you're actually losing money. So that $25 million that you put under the mattress is not worth $25 million when it comes to a project or a different piece. So if you have a million dollar building that you're trying to build, if you wait three, four, five years, obviously it's gonna be 1.2, 1.5 million dollars later. So the time is to spend now. So the first thing, to my surprise, and um, Grace was here and other folks were here, um, but my first article in the paper was, new finance director spend, says spend money. That was my first article. Spend money, it's okay. You have the money, don't be scared. Because guess what, you're gonna get more money next year. Because the way we budget, you will have money. <coughs> that surplus might be $2 million one year, it might be $5 million the next, but you're okay, don't be scared. So it was interesting to see that as we first started. So where does our money go? Obviously it goes to mainly staffing. You can see in the big blue um, pie, pie chart there, that's public safety is $19.4 million, all our police officers. You can see that maintenance services, MSC, maintenance services are the folks that are out striping the roads and cutting the trees and doing the, the weeds and keeping our streets safe and doing all the, the CIP projects for us. Um, that's $5.6 million there on the bottom. You can see at the engineering department, community development, administrative services, that's my department, so that's finance and HR and IT. You can see executive and then legislative as council. So when I first began, the fiscal directors that in the past, they would always say, oh, you know what, we're gonna have a million dollar surplus, or we'll have a $2 million surplus. And year over year over year, we'd have a three or four or $5 million surplus. And we still stuck that money and we put it under the mattress. What Chris Jordan and I did is we changed the way we presented the budget a little bit. And we said, no, it's not a million dollars. We know already that built in, we're gonna have three or four million. So we need to say it, we need to account for it, and we need to start spending it. And so you'll see in this um, budget, that's the, we do a two year budget here. You'll see in this budget, I'm projecting a $4 million revenue over expenses. In the past three years, when I first came, we had a $6 million year over year surplus, a $5.8 million surplus, and a 5.5 million dollar surplus. So nowhere near a million dollars. We're well above that. <coughs> but to say that we're going to take that and put it under the mattress doesn't work. Because number one, we're losing money in our funds. Number two, we have a community center to build. We have infrastructure to look at. And we have um, our unfunded liability for PERS that we need to look at. So we'll talk about that. Um, this is straight from the adopted budget. Just quick highlights. Um, total tax increase was 7% um, year over year. So a $2 million increase in our property tax. Um, Property tax increased 8%. Like we said, I could have easily put 10% in there and we would have been okay. However, I did not put that in there um, based on just being conservative. 
The TOT tax, it's 11% growth over the current year. That's because of the one-time bump in your $700,000 in revenue. That'll flatten out um, over time. Sales tax was at zero, and then every other tax was zero. So really the only thing that moves in Los Altos is property tax as we move forward, and a little bit of the community development uh, fees. The interest income, obviously, as interest rates are better for us, the more money we invest, um, we're getting a better return on that. And the community development fees were strong. And I talked about those pieces. On the expenditure side, obviously, we built in all our salaries. We built in our MOUs. We built in salary increases <coughs> staff, all the different pieces. Um, you're all familiar with um, the budget that we added a Safe Routes to School coordinator. We added a sustainability coordinator um, that's funded out of our solid waste fund and general fund. We had a lengthy discussion on crossing guards, if you all re recall, that was added into the budget as well. Um, we, for the first time, we're, we're contributing money to the Los Altos Chamber of Commerce, $50,000 a year. That's coming out of that TOT increase to help with um, the commerce and their activities. And then the big piece was the CalPERS unfunded liability. Um, we did not have a CalPERS reserve when I first started. Um, Chris and I started and with council's support created a, what's called a PERS reserve. So we're not going to get into too much detail on the unfunded liability today. I know I've talked about it before. But basically we pay about $1.3 million a year in retirement costs for our employees. CalPERS has been writing on this formula for 30 or 40 years that was flawed and they would say, you know what, we're going to get 10% return every year. We're going to get 14% return every year. And finally, that's been coming back to bite them. And so that's not realistic. You're not going to make 14% year over year. You're not going to make 10% year over year. And so what they did was they lowered what's called the discount rate. And what they assumed was that every year they were going to make 7.5%. And just a half percent decrease to the cities, because they lowered that discount rate or their assumption of a 7.5% rate of return, that half percent, the burden goes to the cities. So you can't go back to the employees and get the money from the employees because that's a contractual obligation. You can't get it from other, other pieces. You can't just raise it um, in different ways. So the burden fell on the cities. So it was a big deal, that half percent. So for us, just our $1.3 million payment, every year it's going to go up by about $200,000. And at some point, the payment's going to double to $2.5, $2.6 million. So it's a big deal. However, for Los Altos, because we're so financially strong, we will be okay, we're gonna address for it and we'll plan for it, and we have a plan moving forward. But you can imagine a city like Palo Alto, they're in the paper every week about their unfunded liability. Their unfunded liability is $1 billion with a B. So it was $900 million, $1 billion um, with a B. And that's not sustainable, it's not realistic, and so they're in dire straits trying to figure out what to do. You can then also imagine cities like San Bernardino or Stockton or other places out in the desert that have doubling or tripling payments, they're in, they're in dire straits financially. So we're in, a, we're in a totally different boat here in Los Altos and we're able to address that. So the first thing we did is, if you recall, we have our, our what we used to call surplus, our revenue over expenses. Every year for 20, 30 years straight, it would go towards CIP and it would go towards a 20% operating reserve, which I'll talk about. There was no other place to, to save, if you will. Now we actually have a PERS reserve. And when I first started, we made it a $3 million PERS reserve. Now it's $5 million because every year we've added a million dollars to that. And basically the point of that is at some point this year, we're going to make a very large payment. So it's like having a big mortgage payment with this huge interest rate. We're going to write, out, we're going to write a check for $5 million to PERS and say, here, knock our, start knocking out some of our, our high interest um, loans that we have with our unfunded liability. So the purpose of that PERS reserve is not only to mitigate some of the increases, but also to, to knock out some of those payments. Um, about three or four years ago, I want to say four years ago, the council also had the foresight to make a one-time payment. They made a side payment of $5 million, and that was a huge deal to the, our CalPERS unfunded liability. So once they made that side payment of $5 million, it kind of refinanced our rates, if you will. And we, we, we receive lower rates now than um, typical cities do. So we're probably one of, one of the top 10% of all the cities in California when it comes to being poised for that unfunded liability. So when I tell council, when you see it in the paper, whether it's a local paper or the Post or, or LA Times, I always tell people, Los Altos is fine. We're going to be okay because we can mitigate for that. As long as we're smart about it, as long as we have a balanced approach. How am I on time? So on the, we talk about a balanced two-year budget. For the first time, you'll see a $4.3 million operating um, revenue projected. So this is our... I'm projecting a $4.3 million surplus, or revenue over expenses. 
but I'm already spending that money and I'm already going to budget for it. So it's just balanced and I'll explain why. And then next year I'm looking at about a $4.8 million revenue over um, expense budget for, th for the year. The final amount depends on our loan. So I'll talk about the community center and that the community center got approved. As you all know, the community center is gone, doesn't exist now. And the final amount is $38.3 million. We started out at 25 million, we started out at 30, then we went to 35 million. The final amount that council has approved is $38.3 million. And as we were talking, I said, it's okay, <coughs> keep moving forward. We have the funds, we, we, have, we have the capability to borrow. And just so you know, right now as a city, we literally borrow 0.002% of our entire budget. I think I have a loan for $80,000 out of the $45 million, as opposed to other cities might have a 10, $20 million loan um, for the year. So we have no debt basically. Um, so the one thing that we're looking at is about a $10 million loan. That $10 million loan over 20 years with a very good interest rate is about $700,000 a month. I mean $700,000 a year. That $700,000 a year, that payment that we have to make, remember just fiscally speaking, we're fine because of TOT. The TOT increase came, that happens to be $700,000. So kind of like if you're doing your household expenses and you have this, all of a sudden you have this $1,000 bill, well, I just got $1,000. So we're okay. So now we're still kind of at that net zero. So that $10 million loan, if you will, doesn't scare, doesn't scare me as your finance director and it shouldn't scare council. I know council is very leery about that loan, but we'll be fine. So obviously depending on that loan amount, we'll see where we are um, with our year end. So the, the transfer is needed annually. So we don't put, we're not putting that $4.3 million in the mattress, under the mattress anymore. That $4.3 million automatically by policy, council has a policy that we have to have a 20% operating reserve. So right off the bat, right now, and I'll get to the slide, we have a $7 million operating reserve for our rainy day fund. And every year we put five or $600,000 into that fund to match. Um, national guidelines, GFOA, which is a national um, organization or government finance officers association, their guideline says you should have 15 to 20% um, operating reserve as best practice. So we have that and we've, we've built that in. Then the rest of the money used to go, through, go to CIP and that's the money would just build up and build up and build up. So what I finally asked for last year was you said, you know what, it's very misleading to throw $20 million into a fund and just let it sit there because it makes it look like we have all this money. So what I did was I renamed the CIP fund to the Community Center Fund. So then you could see that 20, there's $23 million sitting in that Community Center Fund and it's gonna go to zero because we'll spend it. So in two years, the, the Community Center Fund should be zero. Then what we did is we created a real CIP fund which happens to have only $4 million in there now. And every year we'll replenish it with this revenue over expenses. Right? And as your finance director, you should never have more than 10 or 12 or $15 million in that CIP fund because we should be spending it as we go along. It shouldn't be zero, but at the same time, it, it should not be $25 million because we have way too many projects to, to, do, to, to do that. So taking that approach of, of a balance. Then the last piece by policy, what we're doing is we're, we're adding to the CalPERS unfunded liability fund. So if we have a $4 million surplus or revenue over expenses, we're going, to do, we're going to put first money in the 20% operating reserve, we'll put money in the CIP, and then we'll put money into the um, CalPERS reserve automatically, year over year over year, automatically. So if we have a, a surplus of $2 million, we'll still put the 20% reserve and we'll put some in CIP and not increase our PERS fund. If we have a $6 million surplus, then we'll put some in the CIP and we'll put more in the PERS fund, right? And just have that balance year over year over year by design, by policy every year. So when we talk about fund balances, this is the slide where other cities would be jealous. This is the slide where we talk about how we're financially strong. So we have many fund balances, we have many funds. We don't have 20 bank accounts. We have one bank account and we also invest these funds in different areas. But what happens every year is I come back at, at mid-year and I say, we closed out the year, this is what happened, this is our unreserved fund balance. So last year I had an unreserved fund balance of over $5 million. Council, here's your unreserved fund balance. Now we need to reserve it. We need to allocate those reserves. So I'll be coming back in February with a dollar amount. Don't know what that dollar amount is yet because we're closing out the books, but it should be four or five million dollars anticipated. And we'll come back and say, we need to reserve it and it needs to go somewhere here. On the left is what council really has control over. We have our operating reserve of $7.2 million. That's your rainy day fund. We have an OPEB reserve, which is other post-employment benefits. Those are health benefits for employees for retirement. That's a $1.5 million reserve. 
our liability happens to be 1.5 million, so we could literally pay that off if we wanted to, but it's sitting in a trust right now. Then we have our CalPERS reserve, like we talked about, $5 million, that's new, relatively new for the last couple years, and I expect to make a, a big payment this year and pay that um, line item down. We also created um, a technology reserve, so we can invest in not only new software systems for community development, so we can go online, our new fiscal system, recreation's gonna have a new system. Basically, every department's gonna have a new system. So we're moving up 25 years in software um, for the city. This includes new laptops, new surfaces, new iPods, iPads. When you have, you know, building inspectors out in the field, we expect them to be digital, all those different pieces. Um, you've heard me say, as um, when I wear my different hats, as HR director, finance director, IT director, we're in the middle of Silicon Valley, right? This is the dot-com capital of the world. I can pull out my phone right now, and I can buy a Honda Civic from the credit union. I want it blue, I want it this thing, and they will come and deliver it to the library tomorrow, right? That's the expectation that we have in, the, in Silicon Valley. So there's no reason why you can't check your building plan or your building, or your business license or whatever it is. This is 2019, it's 2020. So you should be able to pull out an app, you should be able to pull out your phone, check the finances, check your, your account, check your, your kitchen remodel, all online. Same thing with CIP projects. If we have a CIP project like the community center with our new software system that we're going live on um, in less than a year, you should be able to click on a map, click on the community center, see the budget, and drill down and see the numbers. Right? That's the expectation that I have. It's the expectation that Chris Jordan has and that we have as, as a group. So really moving leaps and bounds, and it takes money to do that, obviously, moving forward. So then we have our new community center fund and then our capital improvement fund, as we talked about. Then, the, and this is under council purview. So council can move this money back and forth anytime they want. They can change the names, they can change the amounts, they can do what they want on this left side. It just takes um, a vote, obviously. Then on the right side is enterprise funds. The enterprise funds are obviously, those are required. Those are required by law, by statute, whatever it may be. We have a sewer fund, we have a solid waste fund. We have internal service funds, so I have a workers' comp fund, you know, for example, and other pieces, an insurance fund. And then we have special revenue funds. We have gas tax, and one of the biggest pieces about gas tax is that the gas tax did not get repealed, if we recall. That's a huge dollar amount for the city of Los Altos, for all the cities. So financially, when the gas tax did not get repealed, that's a huge relief on the general fund, because had the gas tax gone away, the money that we pay for the gas tax, that would have been general fund money. That would have eaten into that $4 million revenue over expenses. And then the same thing with Park and Lou. And I'll stop to talk about Park and Lou for a second. So we have what's called an in lieu park fund. And we generally call it Park and Lou. Right now it has $5 million, and that ebbs and flows. And basically what it is is that it's an in lieu fee for developers, especially when they come in and are building multi-housing units, multi-unit housing. And in lieu of building a park, rather than building a park, they actually pay the city a fee. And that fee varies but well, you can call it around $35,000 to $40,000 a unit. So when you're building a 20 unit um, complex, you're going to pay the city, if you choose as a developer not to build a park for your apartment complex or your unit, $600,000. And it goes into the park and loo fund. You can imagine when we talk about 4850 El Camino, 5150 El Camino, which is a 200 unit complex, how much money that is. So just fiscally speaking, not anything else, a project like, um, 5150 El Camino is between um, eight and $10 million in Park and Lou. If they choose not to build a park, if council decides not to do something else with that money. So John Biggs, our community development director, has done a forecast and we look at all the projects that are pending and that, are, that are, uh, have gone to council and that look like they would get approved um, in the near future. And we have up to $16 million in Park and Lou coming. And why is Park and Lou important? The community center is, is a designated park. It's a park and recreation facility. The in lieu park fee is for parks and recreation. So you can use that money for your community center. You can use it to build a park. You can use it to do different things. You just can't upgrade. You can't, it has to be new. It has to be new things. and has to benefit the community. So one of the things that we're looking at, fiscally speaking, is obviously if we have up to $16 million coming in in lieu park fee, we may not need a loan. Because you could, and council could, decide to take that money from a developer or developers in the past and pay the community center cash. So instead of having a $10 million loan, we could use five, six, seven, $10 million in lieu park fee and not have any loan at all. So instead of borrowing $10 million and having a $700,000 payment for the next 20 years, we could use in lieu park fee, and that's huge. So kind of just to be continued on that, right? 
right or wrong, whatever those projects are, whatever the, 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 the decisions of council, obviously for me, Park and Lou is a game changer, financially speaking, because it changes the way we loan, changes the way we do things, changes the relief on the, the general fund. Council may choose to have an in-loop park fund and buy land and create a park from scratch. They may choose to use it for, for different pieces. But that's one of the options, obviously, that we're looking at. Why would you have a, a loan with this interest rate and fees and all these different pieces when you could tap into in-loop park fee? So it's an option. Um, I won't go into too much detail because um, I know we want time for questions, but our five-year CIP budget and plan, we have a five-year capital improvement plan. The first year we allocate real money towards that, so we save the money to do that. Um, the next four years is what we call a plan. It obviously changes over time. Um, right now we have a $100 million five-year CIP. It's $97.7 million. And to give you an idea, 57 million of the $100 million is general fund that we talked about. The rest comes from grants, from projects, from gas tax, from um, all the other areas that we might get revenue in our <coughs> CIP fund. So general fund is obviously a huge driver, but there's many other dollars that come through this because only 60% is general fund. Um, we're addressing multiple priorities when we talk about our five-year plan. We are obviously building a community center. We have park improvements. You have deferred maintenance and infrastructure, streets and roads maintenance, and then safe routes to schools. This slide, I don't necessarily expect you to see, but you can see um, that we have prior appropriations, basically money set aside of $28 million to use for our five-year CIP. So when we have projects, obviously that costs like a million dollars and then they don't finish it at the fiscal year, that money rolls over as opposed to the um, regular budget. And then every year we have our budget moving forward. So you can see the budget for 1920 is $21 million and then $26 million and it drops significantly to seven million. That's because we're building the community center. That's that huge spike. Once the community center is built, we go back to that $7 million. So out of all the funds that we use, whether it's gas tax or Measure B, which is the um, Road Accountability Act, which the, the governor passed, or we use sewer fund or technology or other pieces, uh, we need about $2.5 million a year in CIP, in general fund money, right? So go back to the very first slide or, or the first couple slides where we have a $4 million surplus or our um, revenue over expenses. Right off the bat, you have to park $2.5 million for CIP. Then you, you can have your 20% reserve, then you can fund your operating, right? So you'll never see a finance director like me or anyone else budget so closely that it's gonna eat into that CIP. You obviously wanna hopefully have the CIP money, CIP money year over year over year. And the way we're built, we have that. So if, the, if times are lean, if times are bad and we don't have that, then you would just reprioritize some of your CIP priorities and not spend that two and a half million. Maybe you spend $2 million in a lean year. When times are good, obviously we can then increase it. When we talk about increasing our, our roads and our PCI, which is our pavement condition index, we can have smoother roads and, and, and reduce the, the need for um, maintaining those roads later. So the CIP is really where your, where your money ebbs and flows um, moving forward. So in here, we talk about the new CIP projects. This is all, this is nothing new to you. We talk about the Veterans Community Plaza. Um, we have a capital and equipment replacement fund, so we ask for new vehicles that get replaced on a schedule. Um, you can see all the different pieces that are over there. We report out to council all the closed projects, so whether it's a an undergrounding project or a first street resurfacing or a traffic sign, battery backup, all the, the projects that we have. And then some projects might um, drop off the list. So I wanna make sure I leave enough time. Um, What's, what's, what's our financial focus? We look at the financial lens. Obviously, the community center project is, is a major focus. It's a huge project. It's the biggest project the city of Los Altos has ever undertaken, $38 million. Um, we're looking at, obviously, a debt payment. We have financial commission working out in different ways that we can have a debt payment. The ideal thing for me is if we could find some sort of um, credit, a, loan, a line of credit, so it can kind of ebb and flow. We might need to borrow $4 million, We might need to borrow $10 million depending on where we're at. So we're trying to find something that obviously, and we also want something that doesn't have a prepayment penalty because we could get a 20 year loan with a very low rate, but I might wanna pay it back in six years. I might wanna pay it back in three years. So we're trying to find something that's flexible. But what's obvious is that we need, it's for cash flow. We have to, we have to get that loan to, to fund that cash for the community center. Um, the CalPERS unfunded liability, just being balanced and being um, disciplined to make that payment year over year so it doesn't come back to bite us three, four, five years later. Um, that's the hardest part is being disciplined and not spending the money now instead of um, putting money aside for your CalPERS. 
Um, and then obviously prioritizing our capital improvement plan. We've talked about every building in Los Altos needs to be remodeled or rebuilt or, or, or fixed. And um, Chris Jordan and I and everyone else on the exec team have been very vocal about that. But all our buildings need to be remodeled. Um, as your HR director, we have staff that we've hired. They don't have a desk. They don't have a space. They don't have a, a place to work because City Hall is so small and it's, and it's so old. There's not a place for, for all of our staff to be. So we're trying to get creative. And people are literally doubling up in cubicles and different pieces because we need a bigger building. And we've talked about that for a long time. You, we've also talked about, um, you can see the police department and the shape that it's in. Um, we talked about, we used to have tarps on the roof at City Hall. Like all that's unacceptable when you see um, the fiscal um, health that we have for the city of Los Altos. So that's why you see me as your finance director jumping up and down saying, spend money, you're okay. Don't stress over a $200,000 project if it's needed. Don't stress over this million dollar project because we're gonna be okay as long as that's what's, what's needed moving forward. And then obviously uh, the last piece is council priorities and decisions. Um, council obviously has um, discretion on future projects. They have discretion on CIP, um, priority spending, and I'm very vocal with council to tell them, be very careful of your decisions, whether it's decisions to say yes or no or maybe or defer something, all of that comes with a cost. And obviously I can be very politically correct when I say that. But council needs to be aware of when they make a decision or don't make a decision, there is a fiscal impact. So when they defer something for six months, that has an impact. When they say yes to something, that has an impact. When they say no to something, that has an impact. And just to be aware of that um, as we move forward. So uh, last slide, or second to last slide quickly. Well, what's on our radar? Um, I very carefully put change in the economy as opposed to recession. Um, <laughs> but as your finance director, and if you ask anybody now, a recession is coming. Um, I do believe finally now, we've had 10 years of growth, and this is just unprecedented, but things are slowing down. So sales tax are slowing down, property tax is slowing, development is slowing. However, we're gonna see, we don't, no one I don't think predicts that it's gonna be anything like we saw in 08 or 09, but it will slow. Um, for Los Altos, because it's all property tax and because you're still gonna have your $300,000 house, sell for three and a half million dollars, um, our slowdown is gonna be um, much less than any other city. So I'm not too concerned with the slowdown as long as we're careful. We obviously have our operating reserve, we have all the other pieces to help us mitigate um, moving forward. Um, a big piece that I just want to touch base on is staff recruitment and retention. We live in the, what is the article came out two days ago, the third most expensive place in the country now. Um, number one was Atherton, number three was Los Altos. Um, 90 out of the top 100 zip codes for the most expensive place in the country was in California. Um, to be a staff member and to try to not only commute or work or live in Los Altos is impossible. And so recruiting for staff and retaining staff is very, very difficult. Um, I am the poster child for the Bay Area. I ride a motorcycle to work, many of you know that, because my drive from a city called San Jose, which is not very far, it's 19 miles from here, takes well over an hour and 20 minutes in a car now. Um, we have staff that drive from Morgan Hill, from Gilroy, as you can imagine. We have many um, folks that drive from over the, the, the bridge. And some folks that were living literally in Sunnyvale could take you 40 minutes to get here. Sunnyvale's right here, right? It's the next city over. Um, we have three staff out of 136 that live in the city. So we have 133 people commuting to get here and competing with other cities and other jobs and other pieces. So um, I can go on the soapbox for a long time, but to be a renter living in San Jose, taking a motorcycle, doing whatever it takes to get here, you can only imagine what other people are doing. And I've talked to other um, groups and other commissions. So if I'm your finance director and I have a, what I consider a very good job, how are the folks in the restaurants downtown that serve us at lunch and how are the people working at Safeway and how are the people that are cutting hair and, and, and bagging groceries for us going to live anywhere near here, right? So this is a very difficult problem for us to solve. Um, CalPERS and funded liability, the community center, and then our council decisions. <clears throat> so what do I want you to walk away with? My hope is that you have a better understanding of just the fiscal lens, what we're doing, kind of what goes through our mind when it comes to the, the finances. Our finances are strong. We are doing very well. We have funds, we have reserves, we have money in the bank. Um, we can do that with proper planning. We can um, move Los Altos forward and you can see a, a, a difference, whether it's in our community center or our roads or our streets or different pieces. And as long as we plan for the future and have a balanced approach, I think we'll be fine. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you and I'm, just, I'm very proud to be here and um, really looking forward to continuing to, to push, for lack of the better word, 
to help us move forward and, and really understand what we can do as a city. Um, I'd like to, I'm going to moderate the Q&A and I will um, call on people and then uh, Shally, uh, actually Larry will be running around with the mic so we can have this all as part of the presentation. Personally, as one of the co-chairs of LACC, I can't thank you enough, Sharif, for coming today and <coughs> presenting this. It, it answered a lot of questions that I've had in my mind and I avidly watch and get involved with the city and it was... Um, eye-opening just to see money coming in, money coming out, and, and what's happening with it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Kim. Yes, Sri, thank you very much for the uh, highly informative uh, presentation. I had a question in the second to last slide, you had litigation costs under yes, council decisions. About that. And I was curious about how financially you think about that, because I notice on closed sessions there are I haven't kept track of how many lawsuits the city's involved in, but there are quite a few. Uh, and I expect there will be more in the future. I know that it looks like 5G is headed that direction, depending on what the council decides. How do you factor that into the budget? What's the, you know, how, how much are we spending uh, in attorney's fees? And do you have to think about what to reserve in case they don't go well? Yeah, um, excellent question. That's one of the things that's, that's changed over, over the last couple of years that's certainly on my radar, on Chris Jordan's radar and, uh, and executive team, is that our litigation costs are rising. Um, when it comes to um, whether it's a, when you say no to a developer and a developer comes back and is in litigation or like 5G nodes, for example, is, is, a, is a very big deal. Um, I came last year at the last mid-year and we, rec we increased our litigation cost by $500,000. So we did a mid-year revise of $500,000. We do anticipate again when we come back in February increasing that again um, because of all the litigation costs. So it, it is a big deal. And the more litigation, the more legal fees we have, obviously that, that eats into the general fund or eats into other priorities. So council really needs to take note of that and really understand and I'll, we can hopefully help them understand that these um, decisions, if that equals you know, a new litigation or a new lawsuit, that there's a fiscal impact to that. So we try to do our best to forecast it and to move that forward, um, but there are several that are in the pipeline now and that we have to take into account. So what we'll do is we just, we'll just keep adjusting our budget accordingly, but it is one of those line items, if you will, in the budget that is increasing and that we need to take a look at. So, Nancy? Thank you, Sharif. Um, I had a question. I think there was a recent decision by council, maybe you could expand on it, that had something to do with solid waste fees. Um, has there been a, a decision not to increase solid waste fees or anything that would impact our budget there? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, a couple of weeks ago in one of the meetings that we're talking about the solid waste um, franchise fee and the agreement that they're, we're moving forward on. And it was very late in the night. I believe it was 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, but there was a decision made to not increase the fee year over year. There was, there was a, a metric in there. Don't quote me. I think it was 6 or 7% or 9% over uh, a certain period of time. But the impact to the resident was very small. We're talking $10, $20 over, over time. Um, but the council um, made a decision, I believe, to um, waive that increase, if you will, and keep that flat. But they also wanted to freeze the admin fees that we get, the franchise fees. Um, we get, receive an admin fee for administering, obviously, the, the solid waste. So I'm still in the, in the early stages of analyzing that decision to see what exactly what was decided, what, what was the wording exactly, because that has a huge fiscal impact. Because if they did waive the increase, that's obviously less revenue coming through for us. But if they did waive the admin fee or the franchise fee, then that's something that would um, possibly come out of general fund in the future if we needed to spend on solid waste. So the solid waste and sewer fund have reserves, but there are plans to use those reserves in the future um, as we move forward. So that's a, a good example of a, of a council decision that we just need to make sure that we're aware of. And council can decide what they need. They can make that decision. Um, we just hope that they make that informed decision with the fiscal impact in hand as well. Because many times we'll write a council report with the fiscal impact and it might say option one, two, or three, but it might not have option four or five there. And if there is option four or five, then we need to kind of go back and recircle so that council fully understands the impact. And if they're okay with the impact, that's fine. That's their decision. So. Uh, Nancy, who's? Aaron? You talked about uh, our buildings and the need for all the buildings that now re remain to get 
more attention. So I'm interested in any insights you can share on where you think the major uh, building replacement or major renovation needs to go or will go yeah. next. And I'm thinking about the fact that City Hall just got re-roofed in, in AC improvements. Uh, police building, which probably ought to be scraped, uh, got a new roof. Right. And then you got Grant Park. Right. And maybe maybe others that you're thinking yeah. about, Garden House Excellent or whatever. Excellent question. I mean, obviously we can't do it all. I would think, I, would, I, I know, so first thing we're doing is going by the report that we have. There's an infrastructure report that actually says what buildings should be done and what order, if you will, or which ones are falling apart the fastest or however we want to we'll call it. Um, but then we also asked council to prioritize that. And I had been asking for many years, tell us in order what you want to do. So after the community center, what's next and what are you going to do? And so um, last couple of months ago, we finally were able to put that in order. So what, what we can say is what the council priorities are. Number one is the community center. Number two is the EOC. So the EOC will be built after that, which is out here in front of the police department. So we'll have a real functioning emergency operations center in front of um, the police department and city hall. Um, number three was the police department. So the police department will get some sort of remodel. And then number four, we get into Grant Park and some improvements. And then five through 10 kind of get hazy or fuzzy, if you will. But for us, that was good enough to say, that's good. That's, it's well over, you know, it's millions of dollars worth of projects that need to be done. Obviously, when you put lipstick on a, on, a, on a pig, it's still a pig, right? So depending on what you do and what you're doing, so the, the roof is a start, the AC is a start, but we have to really look at it. When you look at the police department um, remodel, what kind of remodel are we talking? Is it $2 million remodel? Is it a $5 million model? Or is it a $20 million new building? And that's what we're looking at, right, to be able to see what we're doing. Um, so it's, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint the dollar amount right now. So that's what our engineering staff is working on, is coming up with some recommendations. We obviously right now don't have the funds to build a whole new police department. So the idea would get a, get a, a major remodel, if you will, as opposed to just the... Um, Where can I find that, that prioritization? It's in a council um, report, and I believe it's posted online, but I can double check. Yeah. But it should be posted online. It's, it's all public. technology efforts, I still have some trouble finding stuff on the website. Yeah, so you know a, that too. Yeah, there's a technology <laughs> master plan that's on there, and there's a roadmap. It's called the IT roadmap. Sorry. That is online that you can take a look at so you can see kind of what the IT um, roadmap is. Na uh, Nancy and then Jen. I'll be quick. Um, I was curious about rental fees. One of the big discussions we had about the community centers, we had a couple of preschools who were in there were providing, I think, some rental or lease fees. How um, important is it for the city to, to partner with various entities that provide services to our community and in, and in terms receive rental income from some of that? I mean, it's obviously huge, and there's a huge potential with the new community center. So I know one of the, one of the things that our director is looking at is what new... Um, community groups, what new groups can we have come into the community center, use that multi-purpose room, and really have a vision for um, moving forward. Um, what we have a vision of is remodeling these buildings so people would want to come. You'd want to have a Microsoft meeting in our brand new state-of-the-art you know, recreation room and, and really think big on the things that we could do. In the past, I mean, it's very hard to get someone to come into a building that's 60 years old that doesn't have air conditioning, doesn't have Wi-Fi, doesn't have... But with our new state-of-the-art building now, I think we, we can attract definitely new people, and with that comes new revenue. Right, for, for meeting space and for, for other pieces. But really having visions. I'm, I've been very vocal. Our garden house is a beautiful building. It's gorgeous on the redwood groves. It has water that flows through it sometimes. People should get married there. But the building doesn't lend to that right now. If we remodel that building, we had the money to do that. It's really that vision to have wine tasting out in, in the patio with Lacey with lights out in the orchard or get married at, at the garden house and really have that vision for Los Altos, which, I, which we haven't had in the past. Jim? Um, I'm really curious about when you said that there are three individuals who work for the city who live in the city, and we've been having a number of discussions about teacher housing, and I'm just really curious about if there's a discussion regard, um, as part of the teacher housing of getting um, employee housing and um, it's just very concerning to me when I hear about you know we've got these have a block action team that we're gonna really have to be working together and we're depending on ourselves. and just um, curious about that um, related to this um, having a big emergency and how we're gonna handle it with people who <coughs> won't even be able to get here right right to right. 
help the city out. Yeah, um, and that's a huge endeavor, but I think things have to change. I mean, we, we talk about affordable housing, we talk about things need to change, but then when it comes to actual change, that doesn't necessarily happen. This is my soapbox, this is my HR side. Um, but when we, when we talk, even when we talk about affordable housing in a new um, complex and we're trying to get below market rate units and different pieces, it still doesn't put a dent in affordable housing, right? If you're going to get seven new units, 20 units, that's fine and it's applauded to do that. But we really have to make a fundamental, fundamental shift in what we do. Um, we've talked about housing for, for staff and different en endeavors. I know the Los Altos Women's um, Caucus, I spoke to them as well, and we talked about you know, looking at different pieces, but really thinking outside the box because this one, onesie, twosie approach isn't working to get many people here. What if instead of trying to get a house for somebody, what if we had apartments and we paid some of their rent? And you say, come work for Los Altos, we'll pay $500 of your rent or half of your rent or something, but something's gotta give. Come be a teacher and we'll, we'll give you a, a rental stipend. Instead of trying to have this unrealistic dream, I think sometimes of having a house, maybe we should look at housing, maybe we should look at rentals or other pieces that we can take a look at. So we really have to think outside the box and it really has to have a, a different conversation, I think, than what we're doing now. Um, I'm going to move to John and then Larry. Um, just for everyone, anyone who needs to leave, it's 9.32. Um, but I'd like to keep going for the, those who want to stay. So. <coughs> okay, I, um, I wanted to talk because um, as a chief financial officer myself, I can appreciate uh, how outstanding Sharif is and how lucky we are to have him. Uh, he has... He, he, he has evolved since. When he first came, uh, I was pushing him to be more aggressive because he came from probably a city not as fortunate as we are, and he couldn't believe it that I kept telling him, you're gonna have three to five million dollar a year surplus every year, trust me. And, and he, wa he, 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 he wanted to believe it, but he, it took him some time. And also he had to, he has the very difficult task of trying to convince, to, to make comfortable five elected officials who are, don't have the financial background and therefore uh, want to be conservative and are afraid of, you know, uh, the, my God, if the city goes bankrupt on my watch, this is going to be terrible. So anyway, so um, he, he's evolved quite a bit. He's, he faces a very challenging job, not so much in because, because of the financial situation, which is outstanding, but, but having to juggle all those priorities and, and convince the council to, to, to go ahead. So I want to say we're lucky to have him. I keep, I'm worried all the time about uh, Sharif having to, um, to commute by motorcycle, and I'm, I'm worried about it, not just because we would lose a terrific uh, financial director if something happened to him, but also because he's a terrific guy. Well, you, well said. Um, Larry. So um, there's been a huge brain drain in, in the city, you know, very recently. Um, the community center uh, got started, you know, a couple years ago. There's nobody working today who started that project. They're all gone. Um, what are you doing to stop the brain drain? That's the, that's the difficult part. Um, unfortunately, um, Los Altos is landlocked. We don't have Caltrain. We don't have uh, light rail. We don't have a freeway even close to us. I mean, 280 is close, but still 15, 20 minutes close in traffic. So there's a lot of barriers working against recruiting as, as, as a start, right? Um, but one of the things we do is obviously we have to try to stay competitive in salaries. We need to stay competitive in our benefits. That's one thing that we can do. Um, council has, been, has made a commitment the last couple of years to make sure that we're at least competitive in that piece. But you can't compete with somebody who lives in Morgan Hill and a job opens up in Morgan Hill for the same price, the same pay, obviously why wouldn't you look at taking that position? If you're in Fremont, we lose people all the time to the bridge because if you live in Fremont, you live in Newark, you live in Milpitas and a, and a position comes up at a different city, you just saved yourself an hour and 10 minutes every day for the rest of your life, right? So there's the life decisions that unfortunately we can't necessarily um, change, 
But we do need to just, we, we just continue to say, come work for Los Altos. Look at all the projects that we're doing. Look what's happening. Look what we can do. Um, obviously, it becomes a challenge when you're in the newspaper on a regular basis, and you can obviously see what's happening in the city, and that becomes a challenge for recruiting and retention as well. So it's really just really promoting Los Altos as a good place to work. The finances are strong. It's a fun place to work. We, we can do different pieces, but we do need help to, to do that and re, re, retain staff because um, we've had a significant amount of turnover in the last couple of years, and we hope that that stops. Some of it is under our control. Um, obviously, Chris Jordan and I and the rest of the executive team do whatever we can. Um, there's a lot under council control as well. But this um, traffic that we're in that's just crippling us on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not unique to Los Altos, obviously. It's for, it's for everybody. But we've piloted different things to try to get people from the train, to try to look at a shuttle maybe from Morgan Hill or San Jose to get people you know, shuttled over here as an employee but really thinking outside the box to, to, to keep our staff here in Los Altos. Great, All right, Nancy. Um, could you expand a little bit more about the impact of Los Altos being in the papers on a regular basis on staff <coughs> and how staff thinks about that? Um, and just in general, uh, we've had a lot going on recently with our council and the ADA requirements and some discussions back and forth about where they should be meeting, that's had you know, there's, there's been a financial aspect to that, and I'm just wondering, um, you know, where things stand or... Yeah. Um, Without getting myself into too much trouble. Yes. <laughs> um, obviously, when you do a job search for any city or any employer, you're going to do your research, and you're going to go online, and you're going to check out what's happening in their city. So when you see a city that is in cahoots or they're doing well or the council gets along or different pieces, you really want to see that as an employee, especially as an executive or a manager. But if you're applying for a position and council meetings are ending at midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 in the morning, that's going to impact your decision on whether or not you want to work for that city. You're going to look at the council decisions. You're going to look at whether they've made decisions or do things get deferred over and over in different pieces. So obviously, um, council has a huge impact on that. Um, if you're a traffic engineer, if you're you know, someone that's working in the streets and roads, you want to see what projects have passed or not passed over the last couple of years, and how does that compare to different cities. So it definitely has a huge impact on employees when they do their research to... To, to move forward. Um, we hope that obviously things ebbs, ebbs and flows. You know, last year a different city was in the paper every, every other day. You hope next year it's somebody else. And there's always, <laughs> there's always drama and, and things that occur and, and government's not easy and council has a very difficult job. Um, but um, you would hope that you know, they, they would be able to make decisions together as a group without having all this piece. Um, what's unfortunate to see is just the amount of, and I think to end on this, is just the amount of misinformation in the newspaper. It's, it's just alarming to me of how much information over and over and over is just flat out wrong. And we will tell the newspaper, and I'm not talking about the town crier, I'm actually talking about other papers, um, that you just, they just print whatever they feel like printing and it's just over and over. And you get people riled up over it, which I think is part of the sensationalism of it, but it's just flat out incorrect. So if, if people would, would, would ask for the facts or try to understand the facts, it would be completely different. But the newspapers are obviously not helping when it comes to some of these pieces, even when we give them the information, even when we say, here's the actual facts that you, sh that you need to know, and they get put to the side. And so it, 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 it gets difficult, and I don't want to get myself in trouble. Just, just to, uh, I think it's about uh, 20 to 10, but a couple items to conclude. One is if people, um, this is David speaking as a, as a resident, and a citizen and not uh, in any role, if you see things in local media, especially the Daily Pest, um, please take the time to write a letter to the editor and see if they have enough courage to publish it. Um, there is much information about our city that is, Nancy touched on a good point, Sharif, I think you didn't get yourself in trouble, but uh, just the citizens, just come back and say this isn't, these aren't facts. And, to whatever extent any of us can do that, and especially locally and, of course, nationally, it's a great thing. Um, also, a couple of the themes that we've talked about today, the LACC is planning to have um, uh, presentations about. We're an educational forum. We're going to be um, on December 6th. We urge everyone to come uh, same time in the morning. We're going to have uh, Ruth Ferguson from Assemblyman Mark Berman's office talking about the new housing bills. Um, in the future, we're going to have people here from SPUR talking about what SPUR is doing to try to connect cities like Los Altos to, to look at the global picture for the eight or nine cities that are near us 
to see how we can uh, consolidate uh, transit and, how, and, and jobs and housing. Um, so there, the positive side is there are really good people working on these really big problems. And we feel it's our job and duty as a coalition to get that out to the public. So uh, keep wa reading, you know, watching for your emails. We're going to have, um, we think, some really exciting speakers here. And uh, thanks again, Sharif, for coming. It was, it was really informative. I just have one question. <coughs> do you have an email that you send out as, or does your, does your, I know Chris, I get Chris's weekly, does the budget director have an email that goes out to the public about what's happening, or is, it, is yours sort of Not folded so into the city It's manager? folded into the city manager, okay. and so it's weekly. Week, obviously check out the weekly updates, those are huge. Um, going back real quickly to the um, rec recruitment and retention issue, one of the biggest things you look at when you apply for a position is your city manager, and we have a very good city manager here. We, you can ask many folks here that we're here because of our city yeah, manager, and um, Chris has done a really great job for us as staff, and that's part of why we're here. So um, just Let one thing to end on. No, that's great. <coughs> just a question. Would, is the, it is a, the, uh, would you be able to give us a copy of the slide deck? Yes, I, I did um, this morning as well, too. Super, because so we'll, we'll, we'll have that on. Our, great, the presentation. So we'll have the presentation itself on our uh, website. So um, thanks again for coming, and thank you. Thank you.